goes fatally haywire. It was a book and a movie that stunned a generation and changed the future forever. absolutely awestruck by 2001. The first time I saw it, uh, uh, I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. What's this all about? What are you trying to do? Give me a new religion here or, or what? 2001, The Space Odyssey first burst into the public consciousness as a film. Expectations were high because the movie brought together a once-in-a-lifetime creative team. Visionary director Stanley Kubrick and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. Not the only abode of life. But on the movie's release, critics were divided. The initial reactions to 2001 were very mixed. One of the MGM executives left the first screen and said, well, that's the end of Stanley Kubrick, which is one of the best successful predictions of the century, I think. At first, box office sales were disappointing. But as word of mouth spread, crowds clamored to see it turning the sci-fi sleeper into one of the 60s greatest blockbusters. Audiences went expecting a space adventure and left talking about God. For the 60s counterculture, it was the ultimate trip. Apparently, when it first came out, some young man ran down the aisle and crashed through the screen, screaming, I see God. A pop culture myth had been born. But behind the scenes, miracles had occurred. Two bona fide geniuses had calculated and clashed over what the future would look like 30 years hence. How close did Clark and Kubrick come to getting the future right in space travel, artificial intelligence, and alien life in the universe? Their vision of the future begins in the distant past. Both book and film 2001 begin with man's pre-human ancestors. On an African savanna, these primates teeter on the brink of starvation until a mysterious black monolith appears. The monolith shows up at a very critical time the first time, which is in the prehistoric, the dawn of man, and they approach it almost in a very childlike way, uh, dancing around it, moving it, and, and then, you know, feeling uh, compelled to, to touch it, and it is giving off some form of energy. Oh my God, it could be death, it could be life, it could be, you know, I mean, it's a doorway in a sense, it's a doorway into, into another place, you could call it a, a kind of a rectangular wormhole maybe, I don't know. The monolith, as I've said many times, is the alien equivalent of a Swiss army knife. It can do whatever it wants to. A simple vibration pulsed out from the crystal and hypnotized all who came within its spell. Faster and faster spun the wheels of light. With hypnosis, the monolith teaches one of the eight men to wield a bone as a weapon. And in an instant, man's ancestor makes an evolutionary leap from starving vegetarian to tool using carnivore. The monolith has opened the door for humankind to evolve into a startling future. My favorite scene was when the bone flies up into the air and it cuts to the space probe in the same shape moving around. That transition was so fantastic because it spanned all of human history and captured how that learning, that development of the ape of manipulating tools went from just manipulating a bone to being able to travel in space. And it was that continuum of tool use to space travel in that instant shot it was just fantastic 2001 a space odyssey is a novel that was written for the screen clark and kubrick set out to first create a richly detailed work of fiction then they'd pare it down to a movie script it had never been done before or since 1964 seems like the late Jurassic to me. So much has happened since. I was working 
at Time Life on a book called Man and Space. And while I was working on that, I heard from Stanley that he wanted to do the proverbial good science fiction movie. I think the reason that Arthur C. Clarke was the perfect person for him was that Kubrick was always attracted to someone's mind, you know, a brilliant mind, and Clark certainly had it. I think Stanley was the most intelligent man I've ever met. He understood everything instantly. He was interested in everything. And we spent much of time talking about you know, science and mathematics, and he grasped all these things instantly. Almost before he realized it, Clark was locked in an intense collaboration with the persuasive Kubrick. The novel and the movie would come to life at the same time. As a starting point, they chose Clark's short story, The Sentinel. At the heart of the story is an alien monument discovered on the moon that would make its way into 2001. Back in 1948, Arthur Clark wrote a short story which he submitted to the BBC as part of a BBC essay contest, which he didn't win. But uh, three years later, he was able to publish that story, which was called Sentinel of Eternity. And it was published in a little fantasy magazine called Ten Story Fantasy. Director Stanley Kubrick would adapt the story for the screen. His track record was one of Hollywood's finest. With novels as a blueprint, he tackled crime, war, Blast off. and nuclear annihilation. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. In each, he recreated the genre, changing B-movie themes into works of art. Now, he had space in his sights. In 1964, space was an obsession on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Moscow and Washington fought the Cold War with rockets and propaganda. In the lead, the Soviet Union with two historic firsts, putting a satellite in space and later a man. Meanwhile, the United States was mired in technical problems. America was desperate to catch up. The Russians put up Yuri Gagarin on the 12th of April, 1961. That's a key date in the history of spaceflight. Man in space. And then we answered by putting up Alan Shepard on the 5th of May, 1961. On the 25th of May, 61, Kennedy gave his famous national needs address to Congress in which he said we'll go to the moon by the end of the decade. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Kennedy threw our hat over the wall and said, American technology, go get the hat. He, in the meantime, had been killed, a martyred president. And so the space agency, and to an even larger degree, the entire nation, was without question dedicated to carrying out successfully this mission. Far more than most Americans, Clark and Kubrick were caught up in space fever. Their vision would take mankind to places NASA never dreamed of. You're watching The Science Channel, coming up next. Space travel wasn't just an adventure. It was a critical step in human evolution. So, you know, the exploration of the universe is much more than a contest between two mid-20th century powers. It's really the next stage in the evolution of mankind. I think that we are sort of refugees uh, in a temporary abode between the ocean of the in which we were born and the ocean of space where most of human history will take place. What my first trip into space felt like is 
indescribable. Riding a rocket is an exciting beyond belief experience. Feeling the power of those rocket engines as you blast off and the shaking and vibration and the G-forces that you feel pushing you back into your seat. You're not sitting in the gondola, you're floating. You might be floating with your handy dandy little music cassette and little earphones there listening to the theme from 2001. It's mind expanding in ways that one cannot even explain. Imagine something a million times more impressive than the Grand Canyon. That is the first view of Earth, the planet Earth. For all you know, you're floating. And this beautiful, enormous object, the Earth, is turning for your viewing pleasure. Many space flyers are asked, did it change you? How did it change you? Are you more religious? Are you less religious? I've always believed, since I was a small boy and made a trip 30 miles from home, that I knew more about my home because of that trip. Yet, if space is mankind's next evolutionary step, as Kubrick and Clark set out to show in 2001, it will take some getting used to. Zero gravity has serious medical consequences. NASA's got a light-hearted way of helping astronauts adjust in a plane that simulates zero Gs. I see the most that people enjoy is just kind of flying from one end to the other of the open space or doing flips and tumbles. It's fun to have two people there to take you and grab you and spin you around. I call it the Mary Lou Breton eat your heart out experience. Now what happens is in an airplane when you get to this point and the nose is pointed down, well it's time to stop being weightless otherwise you crash in the ground can cause some motion sickness, and that's why the NASA plane is affectionately referred to as the Vomit Comet. Vomiting didn't figure in Clark and Kubrick's tidy vision of space. Though bodily functions add to one of the film's rare instances of humor. With Dr. Haywood Floyd, 2001 jumps into the future. The scientist is on a secret mission to the moon to investigate a mysterious discovery. Zero G's is no big deal, even when he almost loses his lunch. The spacecraft that carries Floyd to the moon features a stewardess who tumbles upside down. Computers that guide all aspects of the ship's functions. And Dr. Floyd, a traveler who looks as bored as any modern-day executive flying the shuttle to New York. Dr. Floyd, bless his heart, I thought of him as kind of a government stooge. A man of very few words, a man obviously of the bureaucracy. I think he represents the bu bureaucracy in many ways, but so too do, do all the characters. On the moon, Dr. Floyd travels to the site where a now familiar monolith has been unearthed beneath the lunar surface. When they arrive, it's just an amazing image that you're on the moon, and there's all the sort of baffling that they've set up, and there is the monolith. And they very slowly walk around. And then it begins to emit this very high-pitched sound. Is this the same monolith that we saw the, the first time? Are there more than one monolith? Did they leave many markers? Dr. Floyd decides to send a spaceship and a crew to follow the monolith sound, a radio signal aimed at Jupiter. The rest of the story is about their top secret mission, which goes horribly wrong. Hey, 
Wow, look at you. All smiles. I finally did it. I made a commitment. Oh, please. Space travel in the real world is a little clumsier than the finely tuned missions of 2001, A Space Odyssey. While the movie mounted a journey to Jupiter, NASA today isn't ready to send men one-tenth of that distance to Mars. Weightlessness and the voyage's duration are formidable obstacles to exploring our solar system. But the worst is radiation. If NASA made the mistake of pursuing a manned mission to Mars, the pilots will be in space for three years, and they are guaranteed to get bombarded on a daily basis by radiation, and the Institute of Medicine says, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know it's going to be real bad. Space is a dangerous environment in some ways, and you have a benign environment in others. I'm often asked, why should humans go into space? Well, why do we ever bother to leave Africa? If we'd stayed in Africa, uh, as we sh showed at the beginning of 2001, by now we'd have been extinct. The future of man and the drama of space come to life in the fiction of 2001 co-creator Arthur C. Clarke. Clarke was born in 1917, the son of a farmer in Somerset, England. From an early age, his twin loves were science fiction and the sea. I was born within half a mile of the sea, spent much of my boyhood on the beach at Minehead, the sea goes a long way there, and I used to build sand castles and moats and let the sea come in and demolish them. I did start reading science fiction magazines, particularly astounding stories, um, at a very early age. I have a complete microfiche set of astounding stories. My favorite one is a robot with a loincloth, which does arouse sort of speculations. And I guess I was hooked. But it was during the war that I think I wrote my first stories. Arthur had been an, a space advocate for 20, 30, 40 years, going back to as a child. He loved the moon. He had beautiful skies over Somerset. He, he had a whole series of, of telescopes that he used. He was committed to the dream of space travel, to the dream of going to the moon. And he's been consistent in that for over a half a century. After World War II, Clark earned a degree in math and physics and began publishing novels. He soon displayed a gift for seeing into the future. Almost 20 years before any were launched, Clark published a description of the modern communications satellite. Today, Clark's idea forms the backbone of worldwide telecommunications and broadcast. But Clark's most famous predictions were still ahead in 2001. In the story, the nuclear-powered spaceship Discovery heads to Jupiter on the trail of an alien radio signal. On board are two astronauts three of their colleagues in suspended animation, and the most unforgettable computer ever filmed, the HAL 9000. An interview broadcast back on Earth gives the world its first taste of the remarkable machine. HAL, you're the brain and central nervous system of the ship. Does this ever cause you any lack of confidence? Let me put it this way, Mr. Amer. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. Well, Hal is obviously the most complete character in the movie. Hal is ultimately the most interesting character. Hal was really the only character in the movie. Uh, the, the, the rest of them were pretty immaterial, as Hal decided. So it is actually the funny thing, the purely abstract computer that displays the most emotional richness. What makes Hal interesting is that he's trying to kill the human beings. <laughs> Before Hal, Actors in robot suits had satisfied Hollywood's hunger for science fiction automatons. One of the first and finest was Futura from Fritz Lang's classic Metropolis. Early in their collaboration, Clark and Kubrick discussed making Discovery's computer, a female robot called Athena. 
Yet they feared the result would look silly. So they made Hal a super intelligent computer with no body at all. Just an unblinking red toned eye and a silken unisex voice. Let me put it this way, Mr. Raymer. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. You and can't now dissociate Hal from the voice, you know. I'm I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. How close did Kubrick and Clark come to predicting what computers might be like in the year 2001? They were optimistic, to say the least. The question of how close are we to be plausibly able to build HAL is, I think, interesting. We have many aspects of HAL that are as good or better than HAL. HAL can understand what people say, and we're starting to see that technology get out into consumer products. Please say the name. It's not quite the level of HAL, but remember, it's running on that little tiny handheld unit. Please repeat the name. What HAL could do, which we can't come close to doing right now, is general object recognition. If we have a computer connected to a camera and we put in front of it a cell phone, a pack of cigarettes, and a chain of keys, we can't tell the difference between them. Since 1950, the standard for determining if a computer is intelligent has been the Turing test, devised by mathematician Alan Turing. If you're in a chat room chatting to someone, how do you know that it's a real person at the other end, or is it an artificially intelligent program somewhere? And the Turing test says that if you can't tell, and it is a program at the other end, that program has passed the test of being intelligent. Today, of course, no machine has come close to passing that. Uh, there have been Turing tests run and awards given to the most human machine, but the most human machine continues to be much less human than the least human human. Unlike HAL in 2001, today's computerized creatures perform narrowly defined tasks. These tasks are often boring, sometimes dangerous. But who cares? It's just a machine. Thinking robots, however, are horses of a different color. These machines must be sociable, not just to communicate better, but because interaction may be the root of intelligence. One robot that begins to blur the line between man and machine was built by the Artificial Intelligence Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Kismet is the first robot that only does something when there's outputs going on there. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything. It just sits there and makes And when you look at how Kismet operates, you can see Kismet making eye contact with people. You see. Naive subjects who've never seen the robot before, we tell them, speak to the robot. And they're able to take turns with the robot. Much as all of us are with other people. We say something, we look at their eyes, we make eye contact, we break eye contact. That signals them that it's their turn to speak, and so on. So Kismet, even though it doesn't actually say anything about anything in the world, pays attention to the right sorts of things. And Kismet indeed becomes smarter and smarter the more social competence it gets. So I think Kismet is a very good case in my point that intelligence has to be social, fundamentally social and embodied, and that's it. Kismet is the opposite of 2001's Hal. I love you. She has the basics of a body and uses it to interact, learn, and grow smarter. Many scientists believe that computers must have bodies to develop intelligence. Intelligence, they argue, is all about interacting. Ultimately, from a technological point of view, computers like HAL are impossible to realize because they are based on a non-embodied form. I don't think we'll ever see exactly something like HAL, because HAL didn't have any physical embodiment, couldn't move around. 
it may be the case that we can write down everything about the world as a set of facts, feed that into a computer and have intelligence emerge. But those symbols that are there have to be related to what's happening in the actual world. Hal, 2001's most important character, may be impossible to ever create. But that's not necessarily bad, because this computer genius has a taste for murder. As the Discovery heads to Jupiter to find the creators of a mysterious monolith left on the moon, Hal starts making stakes that threaten the lives of all on board. So that Hal can't hear them, the astronauts, Frank Poole and Dave Bowman, climb into a space pod and discuss disconnecting Hal. Well, as far as I know, no 9,000 computers have been disconnected. Well, no 9,000 computers ever found out before. That's not what I mean. Hmm? Well, I'm not so sure what you think about it. What they don't know is Hal can read lips. When Poole leaves the ship to make repairs, Hal cuts his lifeline. Poole cartwheels into space. Hal was given this mission, and the scene where he sees the, the man, where he read their lips and they said they were going to disconnect him, it threatened him. It threatened the mission. He fears that they will switch him off. So it's a kind of existential angst. And the other thing is, that he feels a sense of supremacy, that he's better and more important for the whole mission than the two humans. His programming was faulty, and he thought that these stupid humans were lousing up the mission, so he had to get rid of them. Is everything he does programmed because he's a computer, or is he acting on his own? As Clark explains the novel, only Hal knows the purpose of the mission. Hiding the truth drives him to kill. Even the concealment of truth filled him with a sense of imperfection, of wrongness. For like his makers, Hal had been created innocent, but all too soon a snake had entered his electronic Eden. Hal goes on a killing spree. He disconnects the three hibernating astronauts from their life support systems. Bowman who left the ship to try and rescue Poole, finds himself locked out of the Discovery. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. That's it. Goodbye, popsicle people. You know, goodbye, Frank. Goodbye, Bowman. Hal's cruelty is a direct result of a lacking relationship with beings, other beings, as partner. It's the same with Frankenstein's monster, who becomes cruel because he never experiences love and acceptance and being treated as a partner. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! The most common question I get is, well, if you build those intelligent machines, won't they want to take over? Won't they decide we're irrelevant? But we're not going to just build a, a, an evil robot by itself. We're going to build robot after robot after robot, each one a little bit better than the other. We could build dangerous trains if we chose to, but we don't choose to build dangerous trains, right? We've, we've engineered them and seen what works, what doesn't work. As we build these robots, if they start operating in ways we don't like, we'll change direction. We won't build those nasty robots, uh, probably. This is not an alien invasion of intelligent machines coming from over the horizon that have no human values and, and therefore would have no respect for our human values. This is emerging from within our human civilization. And we all are already a human machine civilization. If all the machines stop today, human civilization will grind to a halt. What people don't recognize is that machine intelligence is growing exponentially. Human intelligence is not. As computers grow smarter, they'll share important human traits, such as consciousness and autonomy. These traits are what made Hal seem so human. Some animals may already share these traits. 
According to activists, they deserve protection, even rights. All we have to do is give scientists the right to go around kidnapping three-year-old children and doing whatever they want to them, and we would be able to cure diseases right and left very quickly. We don't do it because it's just unjust and disgusting and wrong. And that's the exact reason why we should not be able to use chimpanzees and bonobos or other non-human animals who have complex minds. There are people who claim that chimpanzees aren't conscious, they don't feel, it's some kind of a parlor trick. We somehow think that they think things, but they don't really do it because we're being anthropomorphic. There are some creatures who so clearly have such complex minds that we should be treating them as persons with rights. Soon, complex minds won't belong solely to organic creatures. Synthetic creatures will make us think about how we're treating them. We treat ants and mice very differently, and we treat mice and dogs very differently, and we treat dogs and humans very differently. So as we build robots with more emotional lives, more intelligence and more empathy engendering in us, there will come a time when we may feel bad about doing things to robots. The fascinating aspect about this new, this embodied AI, is that the creatures only become intelligent if we treat them in a good way. When we create suitable learning environment for them, treat them as persons, then they have a chance to become smart. Good job, Kismet. A smart robot is as much a result of loving, caring social interaction as a human being. Computers and robots may one day join the ranks of non-humans which deserve rights. But if computers earn human-like rights, may they also be tried for murder? In 2001, A Space Odyssey, astronaut Dave Bowman fights back against the homicidal computer, HAL. Bowman blasts his way back into the ship and prepares to disconnect HAL's brain. The only answer was to cut out the higher centers of this sick but brilliant brain. I wonder if he can feel pain, Bowman thought briefly. Probably not, he told himself. And he goes into this room, floats into this room, there's no gravity there, where there's all these circuit modules, and he twists a little tool, and one by one they slide out. And as they slide out, Hal's higher brain functions start to disappear. If you'd like to hear it, I can sing it for you. Yes, I'd like to hear it, Hal. Sing it for me. It's called Daisy. 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 Give me your answer, too. Want me to sing a song for you? Daisy, 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 Daisy. I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> when Hal sings that song, Hal is not the supreme intelligence abstract thing anymore. It becomes emotional. And that's the moment where we can bond. We do not bond with creatures just because they are smart. We bond with creatures because they're emotional. And most people say they relate to Hal more than almost any other person in the film. So to hear him not just dying, but, but that his mind, this brilliant mind, come apart, it was heartbreaking. It's curious as why it is so poignant. It's partly the voice, but it's, it's one of the most powerful scenes in the movie, and in fact, in movies. Before embarking on the dramatic tour de force, 2001 creators Clark and Kubrick screened the best science fiction films to date. They had close encounters with the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't know how much slumming we did in the science fiction movie field, but there have been very few good science movies. I remember I showed him the H.G. Wells' uh, Things to Come, which is one of the classics, but of course it, it looks incredibly corny now. Well, they're rotting. It's barbarism come back again. Four, three, two, 
Maya. They looked at Destination Moon, things to come. Who are you? Morbius of the Bolero. And Forbidden Planet. Forbidden Planet. And it's very interesting that we, when I mention those titles, we all say, oh, those were great movies. Kubrick looked at them and really at one point said to Clark, with things to come, he said, you got to be kidding. The art of special effects was in the Stone Age, and Kubrick knew it. To achieve his vision for 2001, the director had to devise more than 200 special effects, many of them new. And detail by painstaking detail, he constructed a compelling vision of the future. Every element in the film, he went to an expert and had them, if they had drawings already projecting the future, or he would ask them to do that. He talked to NASA, he talked to, to every high-tech company and space company at the time. Great technical detail has gone into the production of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Scores of engineers and craftsmen work designing the sets and props, which combine existing knowledge with the projections of Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick. The other major technology is how do you make, inside the discovery, how do you make it turn? So we turned to a company called uh, the Vickers Company, and they actually made the centrifuge, which is really like a huge Ferris wheel that turned, and they built inside, they built the set of the discovery. It was a real centrifuge, it was not a prop. Kubrick's attention to detail was a growing legend in the film industry. It took its toll on those around him. No one felt it more than his creative partner, Arthur C. Clarke. Even as the movie began production, Kubrick insisted on approving every word of the novel. Clarke wouldn't be paid until it was published. It was three years and counting. Arthur knew Stanley was a perfectionist. He was a perfectionist. He was obsessive. He was all those things. But Arthur said, I don't want his perfectionism focused on me. And he really felt the pressure. How much fun could it be to be stuck in a place where you didn't necessarily expect to be and to have to rewrite and rewrite and a man of that stature, to have someone in Kubrick say, I don't like the verb twittering here, or whatever it was. Were there screaming matches? There may have been. But, uh, but I have a feeling it was relatively civil. There was that respect, again, for the minds, you know, that they both were really attracted to each other intellectually. In the end, Clark endured. The novel was published after the movie's release. It answered many questions raised by the film. People are advised to just relax and enjoy the movie, not attempt to understand it. But of course, a book has to be explicit. So my advice for a long time has been see the movie, then read the book, and repeat the dose as often as necessary. And then, of course, go on to read the three sequels as well. <laughs> Kubrick and Clark's space adventure takes a sharp turn into the strange when the discovery reaches Jupiter's orbit. There, the black monolith seems to be waiting for the star-crossed spaceship. Alone now, Bowman knows he can't be rescued. With nothing to lose, he sets out in a pod to follow the monolith, wherever it leads. When is a diet pill worth a hundred... Force. In one of the most mind-boggling scenes ever filmed, the Force propels Bowen across the stars. All the colored lights that pop up when the hero heads through that stargate. People claim to have seen it stoned. I've never seen it stoned myself. Uh, I wish I had. It was made in the decade of, of the 60s, and it was made from 64 to 68. 
There was a movie that every hippie wanted to see everybody in the 30. While they may, for the most part, be outside the mainstream of American life, they are a part of the wave of the future. Hey, man, <laughs> let's get stoned to go see 2001. Look what was going on to reflect what was happening. The Tet Offensive had taken place in uh, Vietnam. Then we have Martin Luther King assassinated. A few months later, we have Bobby Kennedy assassinated, riots in the street. They were feeling isolated. I think the age group that would have been drawn to that picture, they were feeling isolated by the times. Above all else, this movie is, is one about isolation. Once these evolved humans go into space, they're totally alone. Not only are they alone in space, but they're really lonely in their own environment. It's a very sterile environment. So this was a strange vision that Kubrick had of this clean, lonely world. Bowman's lonely odyssey isn't quite over. The alien force that swept the astronaut across space deposits him in what seems to be a hotel room. There he sees himself grow old and die, making way for a final mystery. Bowman is reborn in an infant form, floating in space, left to contemplate the planet of his birth. There before him floated the planet Earth with all its peoples. Down there on the crowded globe, history as men knew it would be drawing to a close. We can't know what happens to Bowman because we haven't had the monolith make us that ultimate next step, whatever that is. This, this all ties into Arthur C. Clarke's, one of his laws that he said for many years, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The star child comes flying by and everybody's scratching their head going, huh? You know, so it's hard to, hard to figure out, what do I do now? You know, what do I think now? And again, back to his genius, that's part of it. He allows you to answer your own questions. It's a statement about time. It may even be a statement about reincarnation. You could interpret it that way. To me, he told me that time is forever and space is infinite. Much of the movie's power does lie in his ambiguity. Stanley said to me, what we want to do is to create a myth of epic grandeur. And a myth should be inexhaustible and be capable of being interpreted in many different ways. It just speaks to you in the same way music speaks to you. I think that's one of the things he was able to do, uh, transcend language, and in part that's because he doesn't use language. The only other place you, you feel that kind of thing is out in the desert or out in, in the valley in the Grand Tetons. You feel that kind of thing that you're carried away and that you're part of a great plan. And it's amazing that that could happen, that somebody could do that with just some mats and some music and a little toy spaceship, you know? You've entered the Science Channel's cosmic dimension. Ever wonder what's out there? So do we. Search the stars with more of Cosmic Dimension right here on the Science Channel.